Welcome in, everyone, to The Deciding Point, our weekly recap of the biggest storylines going on in the tennis world. In case it's your first time watching the show, here's how it's going to work. We're going to break down the four biggest stories, then we're going to have a little bit of fun with our last point, call it our deciding point, and join me to recap all of the action from the past week in the professional tennis world. You, of course, know him as our crack rackets do everything, the forefather of the forehand slice, James Foster McDonald. Jamie, final ATP tournament of 2020 in the books how are you feeling i'm a little exhausted uh it's kind of nice to have a bit of a break i know uh i know in like two days i'm gonna turn around and be like okay what's the next tournament i'm ready um and especially (laughs) with what we're hearing about australia it's not looking great but hey it is what it is at this point and i think we can look back and say it was a fun one Yeah, Jamie, you're definitely right. I mean, we are all a little bit fatigued. So much action since the tours restarted in August at the same time. Probably Tuesday, Wednesday of this week, we'll all be missing it. But of course, if you have missed any of the action, go check out all of our other content on Crack Brackets to get yourself caught up. But with that in mind, let's get into this week's edition of The Deciding Point. All right, Jamie, I think the topic we have to start with, our final ATP-level event of the season in the books. It's Daniil Medvedev emerging with his first year-end championships. Medvedev beat the number one, two, and three players in the world to earn this title. Of course, it's the fifth straight year we have a first-time champion at these year-end finals. Jamie, your thoughts on Medvedev taking home the crown and, in general, all the action this week in London? Yeah, I mean, well, look, Daniil Medvedev, he deserved it. Um, and he went there, he went out there and he earned it. I think that's a given at this point. To do what he did, especially after the year he had last year, I mean, look, last year he really burst onto the scene, but once he got to the Tour Finals, I think he was a little gassed. The stage was big for him. He did not do well in that round robin, didn't advance at all. Comes back this year completely rejuvenated, refreshed, wins the title without dropping a match. I, I mean, he just looked so good throughout this entire tournament. And in particular today, goes up against a guy in Dominic team who just hit through Novak Djokovic. Medvedev goes down a set, does not panic, switches up the game a little bit, and just gets it done. So it's just a phenomenal result for the Russian. I mean, you look forward to Neil Medvedev. He becomes the fourth guy ever to knock off the number one, two, and three players in the world in the same event. And, you know, that is not an easy task. And for Medvedev, you look really since he began play in Paris a couple of weeks ago. I think that's 10 straight matches for him to end this 2020 season. He's won 82.2% of his first serve points. And look, you're playing indoor hardcore tennis, Jamie. Sometimes it is that simple. And of course, for Daniil Medvedev, you know, that is a little thing he does as well. He can just win so many easy points with his first serve. But then, of course, as returner and as everything else he can do on court, there are just so many different options for him. He can serve in volley. He can chip in charge, short angles, slap down the lines. Obviously, his defensive skills are his calling card. He was the best player here this week, and that feels crazy to say until, again, you look at the fact, fifth straight year with a first-time champion. I feel like that's as emblematic of the slow, trickling generation ship, particularly Zverev, Tsitsipas, Medvedev, the last three winners. It's happening in front of our eyes, Jamie. I mean, the fact that Medvedev and team were definitively better, I feel like that means something. Yeah, certainly. And, you know, we don't have to get crazy into how these surfaces might play uh, to, to benefit players like this. But no, I mean, you're right. I mean, you, you see these different names who are winning this title. And look, you can attribute it to a lot of different things. But in this year in particular, you can't just say, oh, hey, Rafa was gassed at the end of the year. Rafa looked, I mean, he looked physically fine. Obviously, the surface not his best here and loses to Medvedev, who eventually goes on and wins this thing. But yeah, I mean, it's really impressive. And, and Dominic team, you know, if Medvedev wasn't the best person in this tournament, it was Dominic. Dominic team because Dominic team was hitting through everybody, even Novak Djokovic, who, as we've seen for the last decade plus, is just almost impossible to do on a hard court. And so this was just so impressive. I think Medvedev started asking the questions of Dominic team early in this match. Team was answering them. Medvedev said, OK, I'm going to have to switch things up. I'm going to have to put the pressure back on team. He can hit through me. I'm going to have to create some. Yeah, he's just going to have to create some opportunities, put the pressure on him. So look, Daniil Medvedev did a great job tactically in this match. And, and like I said, at the very beginning. He deserves this title. 
And both team and Medvedev, to your point, they both beat both Nadal and Djokovic. They both earned it to get to that year-end finals. Mm -hmm. And it felt like it was a winner-take-all final. We had the two best players of the event. And those were the big takeaways. But, of course, we want to talk a little bit more about these year-end finals. So let's move on to our next topic. Jamie, let's go with the surprises and let's start with the big ones. What shocked you most about this event in London? Well, we touched on it briefly, uh, but to me, it's not seeing Djokovic or Nadal in the final. Yeah. Um, I, I really thought at least one of them would have pulled away into this. And look, I can't say I was expecting Nadal, just given the fact that he hasn't been great on this surface, but I thought he'd be locked in. And to his credit, he was. I mean, Medvedev just outplayed him to get to the final. Djokovic, you know, he just got out hit by team. And so, again, we don't need to rehash this, but my biggest surprise was not seeing either of them um, in the final match. Yeah, my biggest surprise, it's twofold. A, for singles, it was just how good Dominic Team looked on an indoor hardcourt. Not outdoors, not on something slow, but indoor hardcourt, the way he's slugging the ball with his fitness. I mean, he outworked both Djokovic and Nadal, and how frequently can you say that about someone in the same tournament? Obviously, that applies to Medvedev as well. But the other, and I think this has to qualify as the biggest surprise of the entire event, Kulhoff and Mektic. They've never won an ATP title coming into this. This is their final tournament as a pairing, as they are allegedly splitting up after this season. They go on and win the year-end finals, Jamie. I know you were watching the doubles closely. Crazy result in the year-end doubles. I know. Um, you know, look, this was maybe the best doubles competition I've seen at a, at a tour final. Seriously? Not just necessarily saying, not necessarily saying the level, because obviously, you know, in tournaments where you're seeing the Bryan brothers and Jack Sock and people like that, but just the competition was insane. The amount of, uh, you know, super breakers that could have gone either way that really, you know, completely changed the outcome of this was just exceptional. And I, and I think that's why, look, doubles doesn't get enough credit as is. I think we all know that. And, and people like you and me who love watching tennis have that special place for it. But man, if you're watching the doubles competition, it's just so enjoyable and so yeah I, I think overall what a great event but for that pairing in particular I mean maybe they go back to the drawing board here and they're like okay hey maybe actually we should stay so together I'm if saying, we can win big and <laughs> if we can win these big titles it's like a prenup right before we split up it's like unless we win the year on championships then we're going to stick together for another year and it's like I don't exactly. know why they wouldn't do that but yeah certainly to watch Met Kitchen cool off have that sort of success at the end of their pairing it's just funny how sometimes the tennis gods work in that way but let's shift gears now the least surprising results James me. I think we both agree Schwartzman 0 and 3. We saw that coming. Yeah, I, I think that's the one I've got at the top of my list because we said, hey, you know, phenomenal job, Diego, way to get in here, but I don't think you're at this level right now, especially on an indoor hard court, and it just proved to be right. Yeah, I, I would say that. I would also add the fact that someone who was six foot six won. Again, we're on an indoor hard court. We talked about it coming in. Daniil Medvedev won in Paris. Sometimes the results are staring you in the face, and the way he looked in Paris, the way Djokovic and Nadal didn't look that great down the home stretch, uh, that was certainly uh, something uh, to take note. Uh, you know, it, it wasn't surprising that it wasn't the two of them. It wasn't crazy surprising that it was Daniil Medvedev taking home the title. Some of the other, you know, least surprising, I would say the ATP silence towards the Alex Zverev uh, off-court situation, the fact that there wasn't a single statement about him being accused of mental or physical abuse, no update on the investigation, no progress being made. It's just like, all right, let's try and get through this season and not talk about it, and maybe we'll figure something out in the off-season, or we'll get through this new cycle and go away, and it's just like, it's kind of despicable, but at the same time, it's kind of what you expect at this point from the ATP Tour. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, again, in terms of least surprising, that we have had such good tennis as we did. The margins between uh, these top two guys, and I, with all due respect to Roger Federer, really is Djokovic and Nadal than everyone else at this point. It's thin, and they showed the advantage. Certainly, the U.S. Open Djokovic looked like he was going to win. Certainly, Nadal blitzed through that French Open. But Dominic Team, you know, Daniil Medvedev, Tavano Tsitsipas, they're all coming. They're all nipping at the heels. And, you know, we keep talking about this storyline, but there's a reason for that, right, Jamie? Yeah, 100%. It's it's the young guys who are coming and they're gaining confidence, right? Not only are they, you know, not it's not just a couple of them winning masters anymore. Obviously, that's the top of this, but it is a sustained presence throughout the year and and there's no better way to evidence that than by having a next gen guy take home um, the world uh, the world tour finals. So, it's fun yeah. stuff all the way around. 
No. I completely agree with you. Well, then, with that in mind, let's shift gears to a little non-London action that happened this week. We had another teenage champion on the ATP Challenger Tour guy we know well here at Crack Rackets, Brandon Nakashima, who was probably the it thing this summer. If you didn't fire off your look out for Brandon Nakashima, here he comes tweet, were you really even a part of tennis Twitter? But, of course, he keeps living up to the hype, Jamie. This week in Orlando, he doesn't drop a set on his way to his first Challenger title. He's the youngest American to win a Challenger title since Francis Tiafa won a title, I believe, in Sarasota uh, for Nakashima. Now he's inside the top 170. I believe he's going to end up right around a, a new career high in the live rankings of 165. And look, for the 19-year-old American, it's swirling winds in Orlando all week long. He just handled the conditions so well, and that's something everyone says when you talk about Brandon Nakashima, right? The maturity, the preparation. This is a guy who, barring injury, you know is going to get the most out of his talent, the most out of his career on the court. After what we saw in both the exhibitions, Jamie, after what we saw at the end of 2019, early portion of 2020, and now to back it up with this challenger result, do you put Nakashima in the tier of Riley Opelka, Taylor Fritz, Tommy Paul, Francis Tiafo, uh, or, you know, what are your thoughts on him coming out of 2020 heading into 2021? Yeah, I mean, look, I think projection-wise, yeah, I put him in that camp right away. Um, I, I, I'm not comfortable saying he's at that tier yet. Um, I think he's still got a little bit of growth to do. But look, you got to love Nakashima. I mean, his game, he stays so solid and, like you mentioned, just so mature and professional about this. And, and to have that at such a young age is is incredible. You know, he gets into these matches, as you mentioned, not great conditions, and he just figures things out. You know, he takes out the one seed in straight sets in the second round. Then he takes out Mackie in straight sets and just cruises through the rest of the draw. So, look, really great stuff from Brandon Nakashima in this, you know, in this event individually, but also just overall, we've seen him continue to grow. And, and I don't see any reason why that wouldn't continue uh, moving into 2021 and 2022. It was the differences in opponents that he beat, that he had to use different game styles, right? Montiero, one of the biggest forehands you'll see on the Challenger Tour. The guy's absolutely ripping a ball. doesn't matter how windy it is, that ball's getting through the court. And yet, Nakashima was not afraid of playing to the lefty Montiero's forehand, of switching direction on him, on when the wind's at his back, hitting the big serve in volley, you know, hitting the big serve down the tee and serving in volleying because that return is just going to die in the wind. So take advantage of that fact. It was just every little tactic tactical adjustment right against Mackey it's the fact you know Mackey's going to try and take the ball early you have to change directions you can't let him get in a rhythm against Mitchell Kruger you just out physical them if you don't have a weapon it's very very hard to beat Brandon Nakashima and we saw it against Zverev at the U.S. Open as well and so you know again with Korda and Nakashima and Spider-Man coming up the ranks and then of course you do have that quartet of Tiafo, Kozlov, Paul and Opelka Slowly, again, I would say if this was the election needle on the New York Times, we're inching towards optimism if you're an American men's tennis fan because there are a couple of different swings now. I'm not saying we have a Grand Slam champion in our midst, but I do think we're going to get one or two swings at the top 20, maybe even the top 10. Is that too much to say? I mean, it's on the optimistic side, but I'm okay with that. I think, you know, if you're a fan of American tennis, you got to keep that optimism um, because, listen, if you start going negative, you can get real negative real fast. <laughs> but no, I mean, you look at a talent like Brandon Nakashima and the crew that he is ascending to, and, and yeah, it's 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 a group that's uh, worth being exciting about, excited about. I think it's as simple as that. Yeah, I agree with you. Well, then, with that in mind, let's get to our final topic because, of course, we'll be able to talk about the offseason the players are watching most closely uh, over the course of the next six weeks. But our final topic, a fun one. Obviously, when you get November tennis, you get October tennis. When you get February, March tennis that isn't in Australia, uh, it tends to be indoors. And so that got us thinking a topic we wanted to discuss and one we want to hear about from you listeners. Our final topic, today's deciding point Jamie, given that we've seen five different champions at the year-end finals, given that it does feel like when there's indoor tennis because of the, you know, look at the Paris Masters event, look at the parody we've seen there, although again, you could point out those are both at the end of the year. Nevertheless, should we have an indoor major considering how much of the year is played indoors? 
it'd be fun, right? I mean, I think <laughs> right now, I think right now, um, having the the World Tour Finals, I think that's a decent compromise, right? Uh, but I think it would be a ton of fun, right? You know, hypothetically, I, I'm thinking you would take out one of the hard courts and make it an indoor hard, um, and so that way you have a pretty good balance, right? You've got the grass, the clay, um, indoor hard, outdoor hard. To me, you know, that pitch by itself, and you know, that writes itself. Um, now, of yeah. course, you're going to anger a lot of people no matter which Grand Slam you end up taking out. But no, it makes a lot of sense. And, and it's it's okay right now that you have sort of this back half of the season or less than half, but this back side of the season that's got a bunch of indoor tennis and, and that's fun for us. But yeah, it would be fun to sort of, uh, you know, take it up a notch, make one of them a Grand Slam. Yeah, we're both biased, right? You spent your college in Ohio, time in Ohio. You played a lot of indoor tennis. I grew up and played tennis exclusively in Michigan. You're indoors for half the year, if not more. And it's just like, yeah, considering how much of tennis is played indoors, why not make there an indoor championship? Give guys who played in, you know, you see a Gerasimov run or like an Andre Martin. And of course, indoor tennis. Uh, the prevalence of the serve that becomes a huge factor when you go indoors. But I, I kind of like it. Like, I, I really do like it. I, I don't know. Could you facilitate an entire event indoors? There are some incredible complexes across this country. Certainly, I'm sure they exist elsewhere around the globe as well. I think the answer is yes. You could find, you know, 60 indoor hard courts in one facility to run an indoor event. I'm sure it exists somewhere. Um, but I'm in favor of it. Yeah, I see no reason. Indoor clay has always appealed to me because, like, we never see an indoor clay event. What would that even look like? Would Nadal's advantage be somewhat neutralized? I know it wasn't in the final, but all things that I, you know, I guess the answer would be why not, to your point, diversify, have an outdoor and an indoor hard court slam. But if they don't do it, I won't be offended. Yeah, again, the current setup is fine. We have a big tournament that's right above the Masters, right below the Grand Slams, um, and, and that's indoor. I think that's good enough for now. But yeah, if they ever want to you know, get crazy and switch things up, swap one of the hards for an indoor card. Why not? <laughs> Perfect. And, and on the list of issues tennis has to confront this offseason, we'll just put that right at the bottom of the list. But with that in mind, that'll do it for this week's episode of The Deciding Point. Of course, if you missed any of the other action from the past week in tennis, go check out our website, crackrackets.com. You can find all of our podcasts, articles, videos, and more. Uh, but with that in mind, a huge shout out to my co-host, Jamie McDonald, our super producer, Daniel Westoff, and to all of you Crack Rackets fans for tuning into this week's episode. But for my wonderful co-host, Jamie McDonald, our super producer, Daniel Westoff, and all of us here at Crack Rackets, I'm your host, Alex Gruskin. We hope you, we will see you all next week. And happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Take care. <laughs>